If we want to find solutions to today's challenges and build bridges across divides, we need a deeper understanding of global issues. The Pulitzer Center supports journalists all over the world who report on topics like climate change, public health, migration, and more. We share that reporting through public events that engage wide audiences and lesson plans that inspire the next generation. Support journalism and education for the public good. Become a Pulitzer Center champion today. Welcome to In Conversation with Fiona Lloyd Davies and Robert Flummerfelt, The Cost of Cobalt, part of the Pulitzer Center Conference, Environment Redefined. I'm Kim Sawyer from the Pulitzer Center. As our audience settles in, please let us know in the chat where you're from. And for those who have not joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and education organization with the mission to elevate public engagement with underreported issues. While we're based in Washington, DC, our staff and our work are global. We support more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets around the world, not only on the environment, but on the other themes as well, such as racial justice, migration, global health, and more. We don't stop with the reporting. We have strong education and public outreach programs. Environment Redefined is the Pulitzer Center's fourth annual conference. In past years, we've explored topics of gender, peace and conflict, and religion. We're so glad you're joining us this year for our first virtual conference. If you're inspired by what you hear today, please consider supporting our vital mission. And now a few logistics. We'll begin with a conversation between the panelists and then aim to answer questions from the audience. Please add your questions anytime via the Q&A icon and we welcome questions. Note, all attendees are muted, but if you cannot hear us, let us know via the chat box. We are recording this session to post online and we are also live tweeting. You can join the conversation with the hashtag Hashtag environment redefined. And one more note, please stay online once this session ends to participate in a brief survey. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Filmmaker and photojournalist Fiona Lloyd Davies has been making films and taking pictures about human rights issues in areas of conflict since 1992. Her work has taken her to Bosnia, Iraq, Pakistan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Fiona is based in the UK and is a graduate of the Royal College of Art in London. She has worked with BBC, Al Jazeera, Channel 4 News, and France 24. She now has her own company, Studio 9 Films. I am a longtime admirer of Fiona. In 2013, with support from the Pulitzer Center, she produced Seeds of Hope. It is the story of Masika Katsuva, a survivor of rape who campaigned against rape as a weapon of war. And she personally helped, housed, and fed many other women survivors of rape in Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a magnificent film an award-winning documentary that was shown at the Global Summit to End Sexual Violence and Conflict in London in 2014. In the new film, The Cost of Cobalt, Fiona once again takes viewers to DRC. This documentary exposes the enormous consequences of industrial mining of cobalt, and it asks important questions. What is the effect on pregnant women and babies who live near the mines? How has the government responded? Fiona, would you like to add anything? Um, just a thank you to Pulitzer for supporting um, my work and also this project. And, and thank you very much for hosting this conversation with Robert and, and I. I'm very pleased to be here tonight. Great, well, thank you. And now to Robert. 
uh, Robert Flummerfeld, the director of The Cost of Cobalt, is an investigative journalist and human rights researcher based in DRC. He is fluent in Kiswahili. Robert has experience documenting human rights abuses, sexual exploitation, and corruption. He's investigated security forces, transnational corporations, UN agencies, and NGOs throughout Eastern Congo. And he reports on conflict and humanitarian crises. Working with the Thomson Reuters Foundation and the New Humanitarian, Robert investigated sex abuse among aid workers in the World Health Organization and other NGOs during the Ebola crisis from 2018 to 2020. And he was called to testify before the UK Parliament's International Development Committee. And Robert, please say hello. I can only reiterate what Fiona put so graciously. Um, I'm very appreciative to be here and uh, very appreciative to the Pulitzer Center for supporting the project and organizing this conversation today. Thank you. Uh, Fiona, I think we'll, we'll start with you. And do you want to tell us a little bit about the film, uh, why the title, The Cost of Cobalt, and why did you want to tell this story instead of many other stories? Sure, thank you. Um, well, uh, I wanted to um, uh, make a film um, about this issue of cobalt and um, it's such an enormous issue. It's so important to the world as a, a way of, um, um, you know, to, to provide um, different energy and for electric vehicles. And it's, you know, a very complicated story. But when I saw um, an article, a research article um, about uh, the link between mining and birth defects um, uh, almost exactly a year ago. Um, I thought that this was a story that I hadn't seen uh, widely reported at all and that it offered a, a, a really strong argument to, to get a commission um, because getting a commission for films in Congo is often um, quite difficult and challenging, um, but uh, it, it was something that um, I thought was important enough um, to investigate further. And so um, uh, doing research and um, uh, finding that actually uh, scientists in Congo um, and in, in Katanga, uh, in Lubumbashi, University of Lubumbashi, are finding increasing evidence uh, that links uh, a much higher risk of uh, families and especially uh, fathers who are uh, families who are living and fathers who may be working, but also mothers working close to or in mines uh, and especially in industrial mines, that there's a much higher um, uh, link to birth defects. And <clears throat> so once I started you know, looking into the research and then obviously uh, working with Robert, um, we found that uh, doctors and, and scientists um, have, you know, have been doing this actually for quite some time. And um, it's extraordinary really that, that we're the first people to actually make a film about this because it's not something that in some ways is new. It's just, it's a story that has yet to really uh, be reported um, until now. So um, we felt that this was a really important story to do. And um, we were fortunate, you know, I was fortunate to, to gain a commission from Al Jazeera. But I feel that, you know, in, in many ways, this is really just the tip of the iceberg and, and something that, you know, we definitely want to um, investigate more of. So, R Robert, um, you've told us that this story has been misreported or unreported. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, just generally sort of looking at, you know, the landscape as far as international media, international press, but in particular in the East Congo, uh, one of the things that I find most troubling is the sort of readiness of international media um, to submit to particular narratives, um, often narratives that are convenient or at a minimum harmless um, to very powerful actors um, in contexts like East Congo. And definitely looking at the mining um, and looking at cobalt in particular. This is one of those spaces where a lot of narratives come in that have created very lopsided coverage. Um, you 
see even in this clip that we just played, sort of the dichotomy between um, so-called artisanal, you know, informal mining where people are going down and with their hands, you know, often sort of bare feet, pulling cobalt out of the ground and uh, larger sort of industrial operations um, that are engaged in this sort of extraction of cobalt. And so much coverage uh, looking at the extraction of cobalt focuses very closely on the artisanal miners and the sort of informal hand mining um, sector, looking at problems like, uh, very real problems like child labor or unsafe working conditions, but by extension, really ignoring what is a massive and very important issue of numerous problems that are caused by these powerful, mechanized, billion dollar operations, you know, that are owned in Mauritius or publicly traded in Canada or controlled in China that, as our film suggests, um, and as researchers are finding are potentially poisoning the environment, causing massive public health crises. Additionally, we don't get into this in the film, but engaging in massive human rights abuses in many uh, instances. So suffice it to say, there's a whole world of, um, large destructive tendencies on the parts of these big industrial actors. And a lot of that is really obfuscated in what is fundamentally, I feel, lopsided coverage that only looks at um, the issue of hand miners, um, you know, people making less than $3 a day, pulling cobalt out of, pulling cobalt out of the ground, yeah. I think so, to add, add to Robert's um, uh, point there is that there has been uh, quite a lot of coverage and attention to the use of child labor in artisanal mining. And clearly that is a, um, you know, a, a abuse and, and it's a very important story, but it is in a way a, a side story. 30% of mineral, mineral extraction um, is, uh, is, is done in artisanal mines. So the, the greatest majority, 70% of uh, cobalt and copper is extracted on an industrial scale, but because the use of children is, um, I think, in some ways attracts a lot of attention. It's been quite, um, in some ways, I think, beneficial to, to as a, as a distraction away from these massive issues about, uh, you know, widespread contamination of the environment um, and the public health issues to uh, that, that are linking um, uh, this kind of mining and uh, causing. Um, uh, widespread birth defects, some of which are so serious that um, the baby is stillborn or um, the fetus isn't, isn't viable and um, uh, it doesn't even reach um, full term. Mm -hmm. So was it difficult to get the film commissioned? You alluded to that a little earlier. Yes, I mean, um, you know, obviously we, we live in, in challenging times and um, the sort of combination, I think, I think I've been working in, in Congo making films and uh, uh, doing stories since 2001. And it is, um, you know, by and large, a, a massive battle to, to get a commission. Um, and the opportunities are sort of few and far between. So, I mean, it's taken um, a year really from um, first um, approach of broadcasters to um, the, the film was broadcast 31st of March and is, is you know, will be online, which is great. Um, so it, it was challenging and um, it, it took quite a long time to find the right home for it and to find somebody who, who was interested. And then uh, fortunately uh, Al Jazeera uh, People in Power slot um, commissioned it. And, uh, but we had to do it in stages. We got some development uh, funding and to do some more research and uh, for Robert and I to work together, um, which is the first time we've made a film together. Um, and then uh, slowly we got the commission and um, were able, Robert was able to, to go to uh, Lubumbashi to Katanga to film in January. So it was quite a long drawn out process. And I think, you know, um, it sort of illustrates really the amount of time and investment that's needed by, um, uh, you know, for, for us to actually bring these important stories and that one has to stick with them and be persistent and, and not give up. And, um, you know, that in itself can be quite challenging. So um, in some ways this was maybe slightly uh, easier, but it just took a long time. Mm -hmm. And R Robert, what was it like to be on the ground there in Lumumbashi and Katanga? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, 
I've been based in Eastern DRC for a while, but really Katanga, um, you know, which is in the Southeast, um, which is an area where I've not um, spent a lot of time working is uh, sort of a different universe. Um, and obviously you know, a lot of sort of really vivid experiences. Um, one that sort of stands out to me, one sort of stretch of experiences really that stands out to me that I think actually is illustrative of the, of the point that we were sort of making about the, the dichotomy. Um, you know, when I, I believe in, so as Fiona mentioned, um, we got some development money and I was working in Katanga for a bit in October, um, sort of picking up pieces of the story and sort of having a sense of um, the scale of the problem, talking to different experts, spending time with them, sort of building trust and so forth. Um, but we actually sort of returned and started properly filming um, in January. And uh, when we turned up, you know, you have sort of, uh, there on the tarmac in the Lubumbashi airport, you know, this Lear private jet, you know, with guys in suits coming out, being greeted with pageantry by officials in the Congolese government. Um, and then we dashed pretty much straight away to um, Kolwezi, which is an area where we did a lot of um, filming. It's one of the major sort of mining towns in the region. Um, and there, there's a lot of sort of quite striking imagery in Kolwezi in the sense that you have these massive mining concessions and the population is, you know, all around the mining concessions. Um, it really illustrates, as a matter of fact, you could see it in the aerial um, uh, uh, clip from the film, you know, populations right there sort of living right up against this massive concession. But we went there first and foremost uh, with the intention of doing a little bit of filming with artisanal miners just to show, you know, here's the stuff, it's in the ground, here's cobalt. And so we went to an area where these artisanal miners work, you know, members of this mining cooperative, which all of these sorts of concessions are generally in the shadow of these large industrial operations because the deposits are all sort of in one place. So your industrial actors are here and your small sort of hand mining operations are here. And so we went with them and you have what I can only describe as resembling like the separation wall in, in West Bank, you know, this massive sort of dividing wall and private security driving around in shiny vehicles and the low rumble of this mechanized, you know, $100 million operation. And then we, you know, sort of turn to the right and go with uh, hand miners in tattered t-shirts tattered with flickering head torches and, um, you know, bare feet rappelling down into the earth, you know, where they're doing the digging. You know, myself as a journalist, I can't think of a better illustration of, you know, myself as a journalist sort of having the impulse of uh, hoping to hold the powerful to account and scrutinize the powerful. I can't think of a better illustration of the sort of dichotomy between a group of people who receive so much media attention, um, you know, every every instance um, often of, uh, you know, unsafe conditions and so forth is really scrupulously documented, very importantly. But over here you have the actors, you know, stepping off the Learjet and going to these mechanized massive operations um, that receive a lot less scrutiny. So that's a real great sort of visual representation of exactly what it is um, that we're sort of talking about here. But that was, you know, of course, one experience of many um, in the course of the shoot, but I thought an illustrative one, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, we'll come back to that and maybe you can tell us more later. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone in the audience to put uh, your questions um, in the, Q and A, and we will get to your questions shortly. I also just want to welcome all of you who have come from Brazil, USA, and let's see, also uh, DRC. So welcome, uh, Fiona. A question for you: uh, When I watched the film, I was struck by the tremendous care the research scientists, the doctor, and the night nurse took for their patients. And it was you know, wonderful to see. You let them tell the story and they're very relatable. They're kind and concerned. How did you go about finding them? And how did you build trust with them? Um, well, obviously it was a, a very much a, a, a joint um, uh, enterprise with with Robert and his skills. Um, initially, uh, I approached uh, um, the uh, an academic in Belgium who is working with the Congolese scientists, and he put me in touch with them. And I think what you know what came across um, 
just in, in conversations on the, on the telephone or, or Zoom calls was that, um, you know, they, they care really passionately about this and they've been doing this work for, you know, a, a sort of a decade really and very little attention has, um, has been made. You know, they've, they've really, they've published work but very few journalists have reported. It has been reported in print, but not on film. So I think, you know, part of the reason we were able to uh, gain their trust and to um, build a really good rapport with them was that they are really passionate about this and they welcome the, you know, the chance to actually be able to talk about it and for us to report uh, their work. And so I was able to, you know, make initial contacts and then um, introduce Robert to them so that he went not just once, but twice. And I think, you know, having worked in, in Congo a lot, one of the things that really makes a difference when you're building a relationship with contributors, especially when you're dealing with very sensitive subjects and obviously birth defects and people who are either reporting as scientists and researching or as clinicians who are seeing the eff effects of birth defects firsthand, you know, and their parents. This is an incredibly sensitive subject. Um, and if you go more than once and you, you know, maintain an interest and in um, you, you follow a story for a while and it, it builds, it goes a huge way to making, um, you know, to building the trust with contributors. And so we were fortunate really that uh, Robert was able to go on a recce in October, um, as uh, he, he said before, and then was able to go back in January. And all through that time, you know, we were maintaining um, a, a relationship with them and, and sending emails and talking to them to find out what new research was happening, what else uh, we might be able to film. Um, so it's, it was, you know, building sort of layer upon layer of, of consistent um, uh, contact with them. And also, I think, you know, Robert's um, uh, skills on the ground and, and going to spend time and, and sitting and, and listening to people and letting them tell him. But obviously, that's for him to, um, you know, uh, Robert, you, you can talk about how you built trust with, um, uh, you know, the contributors that, that we were able to film with. It's, it's rubbish, all of it. No, no skills to speak of. Um, but no, seriously, I do think, um, as um, as Fiona put rather well, one of the most important factors was the fact that, you know, in the grand scheme, we spent you know, the better part of what six, seven months working on this project um, that started with my working there and spending time listening to um, a lot of these researchers and developing uh, those relationships in the first instance in October steadily communicating with them and frankly deepening our understanding of the issue and the scope of it um, and changing sort of our concept of what it is uh, that we're looking at and then ultimately coming back spending a month actually properly shooting the film I definitely think probably one of the largest obstacles to good reporting in DRC generally is this sort of parachutism of coming into a place and running around for a very brief period of time and running away. Um, and I, I, I think that we, we tried our damnedest to not do that um, in connection with this project. And so um, I think that's probably one of the, one of the most important factors there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you were also able to build trust with the families of those who have been affected. One of the, um, people we see early on in the film is a mother of two children with cleft palates. And, um, you know, I think that was a way to bring us into the film and to show us, uh, you know, what these health consequences are like for families. Um, I want to turn now to a question uh, from the audience. This is Robbie Seaton Todd, who's asking, how, if at all, do these large multinational companies respond to investigations of their role in these environmental and public health crises? So what is the response from the multinational companies? Well, just to start, because I think, yeah, Robert's got some important things to say about working on the ground, because I think it's, in a way, there are sort of two aspects to this. There's the um, you know, general aspect of obviously to give offer a right to reply to the mining companies because we show um, a, a smelter and um, an open cast mine in the film. Um, and 
uh, despite approaching um, several the, the mining companies that we filmed and also the um, there's a, a sort of body that um, represents all the the mining companies uh, in Katanga we approached them as well um, uh, I received no uh, response at all um, and I think for me and you know that's um, indicative of um, you know, a certain amount of arrogance that they feel that they don't need to respond um, and I think uh, Robert experienced firsthand the um, very aggressive uh, tactics that uh, these industrial minds um, employ, which he, he'll, I'm sure he'll uh, explain in a minute. Um, but I think this also adds to, to what Robert was saying about um, the sort of misreporting or underreporting of the story is that these industrial minds are so aggressive that they make it very, very difficult for journalists to report this story. And if you are a, a journalist with a limited budget and you only have two or three days or three or four days, which some people do go to Katanga for that and for that length of time, um, and it is much easier to report um, the artisanal mine story. Um, and uh, you know, I'll hand over to Robert now because he's he experienced firsthand, the, you know, the incredibly aggressive tactics of these mining companies um, and and the consequences. Yeah, definitely. Um, probably the biggest obstacle that we faced in the course of filming this um, is a perfect illustration of exactly this point of the industrial actors doing everything in their power to avoid any scrutiny whatsoever. Um, at one point while we were filming in Kolwezi, um, a member of our crew, uh, who is a, a Congolese lawyer who's based in Lubumbashi, who's there with our crew, um, was uh, detained by private security um, for this mine. We weren't on the site of the mine. Uh, we were in a nearby residential area. And uh, they came up in this sort of private security mine vehicle, came, first started accosting us just about the fact that we had a camera and just the fact that we're, you know, visibly sort of media. Um, obviously, we had all documentation. You know, I've been working in the country for several years. We have all documentation, all accreditation, um, all relevant ministries, bodies in the government that sort of signed, up, uh, signed off on us working there. It didn't matter. That member of our crew was physically detained. They threw him in the back. They dragged him um, to this vehicle, threw him in the back and drove off, and then processed him through military justice, sent him to the auditora, uh, which is, you know, for soldiers, where he was held in a three meter by three meter cell with, with 12 other people. Um, the guard encouraged the other inmates to physically beat him, said, you know, I want to hear him cry. Um, and he was detained there for the better part of three days. Processing a civilian through military justice is a serious violation of human rights. And the mine did this to uh, a crew member of an Al Jazeera documentary. You know, I mean, this is the sort of brazen behavior that illustrates, A, the brutal measures um, that will be undertaken uh, by these actors to prevent any scrutiny, but also, B, you know, the auditora is the, it's the army, it's the Congolese, you know, security forces. It illustrates the extent of sort of um, really ugly straight state capture, you know, the police and the army sort of being instrumentalized um, by these private actors that are here, you know, for the singular purpose of extracting minerals and um, securing profits. Um, and the security forces, the army and police, um, um, implementing tremendous brutality to support these international actors. And of course, this is not an isolated incident. It's shocking that it happened to a member of an Al Jazeera docu or a crew member of an Al Jazeera documentary. And it would be ridiculous if it were just this one-off incident. But if you look at the history of these mining concessions, you know, in many cases you have forced evictions carried out by soldiers or by the police, tremendous violence, you know, um, tremendous human rights abuses. Um, and we ignore all of this if we're not scrutinizing these, um, these actors, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Fiona, um, did you try to get a response from the government? Yes, and um, you know, I was uh, anticipating that it would be uh, quite difficult to, to do so. And so I first uh, made approaches in December. Um, and even despite, you know, quite considerable um, uh, requests, 
uh, we, you know, we weren't able to get um, anyone to uh, to give an interview. And I was told by several people that it was um, there was, in fact, one of the the minister of mines had just resigned. Um, a new one was about to be appointed in December, and then, in fact. I think when we when Robert was filming, um, the new minister resigned as well. Um, so it was again, uh, you know, another reflection of the the the, the failed state uh, of of Congo and the you know huge political issues that are um, ongoing in this country in this country and have been for some time. And you know, nobody will take responsibility. Um, you know, this is uh, even even in the last. Um, Months, there's been um, an explosion or a, 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 a sort of quite a sizable spill of acid into um, a lake where I think that provides drinking water, and um, you know nothing has been, very little has been done, and very you know very little reporting has been done apart from uh, human rights workers in in the in the region who are trying to bring it to light. So it's extremely difficult to get the the government to engage on this. Um, and, you know, despite, um, you know, spending sort of uh, two months doing it, we, you know, we were unsuccessful in getting any response from the government whatsoever. Um, we have a question from Lauren Merrimilstein, uh, and this is for Robert. Are there any efforts from miners to unionize and improve the working conditions in the artisanal mines? If so, are they successful? I don't know how much you examined the artisanal mines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, it, it is a, a bit separate from the subject matter of the documentary. But I mean, the structures of these um, of these uh, um, are the, the structures within these within which these artisanal miners often work are sort of cooperative structures. Um, so they're, you know, sort of organized um, workers cooperatives. I think a lot of the trouble is the fact that these um, cooperatives don't have any leverage in terms of controls, uh, controlling um, prices. Um, you know, they, it's in many cases like a single buyer, only a couple of industrial um, you know, buyers of this sort of cobalt that's produced by the hand mining. Um, and so I think that it's, you know, difficult to set wages or, or anything to that effect um, because of the structure of, uh, well, just because of the mechanisms by which cobalt's priced and so forth. But anyway, I'm not an expert on that, uh, to be sure. And it's a bit sort of separate from the uh, subject matter of the documentary. Yeah. We, we do have another question from Calaver Hermano, and this is on, on relating the workforce in the artisanal minings to the big mining companies. So I don't know if there's any back and forth between the two groups of miners. Um, we generally speaking, they're separate. Um, they're, they're, they're separate sets of, of people that are doing um, these sorts of work. Yeah. Um, it's, it's it regard it, one way or another, um, you know, cobalt mining is a massive source of livelihoods for, um, uh, uh, large portions of the population. And indeed, importantly, artisanal mining is a huge source of, um, income for a lot of people in, uh, in Katanga. Um, and it's, I think, a larger group of people to be sure who are, who are sort of, um, uh, benefiting from that artisanal um, mining than it is people who are working, um, you know, sort of formally employed by these uh, by these industrial actors. Yeah, so it's usually sort of separate groups of people. Okay. But the industrial actors will buy from the artisanal um, cooperatives often. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we really appreciate these questions. So please keep them coming. Put your uh, questions in the Q and A. And I want to return for a minute to something uh, you said about holding the mining companies accountable. And there is one uh, person in your film, uh, Fabian Mayani, who is the program manager at the Carter Center. And tell us um, what he has to say about holding mining companies to account. And then you also might want to talk about what not only what Fabian Mayani, but others in DRC see as solutions. What are they talking about um, to solve this problem? Yeah. Um, 
Fiona, would you like to start? Or well, I'll, I'll, yeah, just to to start. Um, I think you know it's it's very well accepted that um, the mining companies um, are not uh, fulfilling their um, mandatory obligations and that they should be publishing um, environmental impact reports. Um, the mining law uh, was um, reformed and uh, sort of strengthened in 2018, but um, again, it's widely recognised that the Congolese government is too weak and. Um, uh, in some parts uh, corrupt uh, and is not holding these mining companies to account. Um, and this is sort of widely known and recognized. Um, and I think you know, pe people like Fabian and, and, and Robert can, can say more about when he spent time talking to him, um, that you know, they're quite frustrated that they uh, do what they can. But I think you know, what, what can be done, I think is um, you know, the cobalt, the mining companies are international companies and, you know, Glencore, for instance, is, a, is a, you know, one of the world's largest mining companies um, that's quoted on the London Stock Exchange. And so, you know, you can actually have governments that can put pressure on mining companies. Um, I think one of the, the biggest problems is that the majority of the mining companies are Chinese owned and the Chinese, you know, are not particularly interested in human rights and um, uh, you know, it's not always, uh, you know, successful putting um, diplomatic or, or, or international pressure on them. But clearly, it's, you know, it's well known that these, what these mining companies are doing, and yet um, uh, they're being allowed to continue to do it. I, uh, Robert, I'm sure you can say more from what uh, Fabian said to you when you met him. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a common refrain um, that the trouble's not per se the law, uh, but rather sort of the implementation of the law. Um, and this was definitely a point that um, Fabian and uh, some others made a bit more forcefully as well. People were more comfortable um, talking off the record, um, you know, that there's a pretty, um, there's a basically sort of functional regime, a regiment in place, you know, inspectors going to mining sites, things like this. The trouble is circumstances in which, you know, these inspections are conducted in a sort of tokenistic way, box ticking exercises, primarily because of political interests that are, um, have staked interests in facilitating the frictionless um, extraction of these minerals and uh, frictionless processes for making profits in which they have um, you know, because of structures of corruption or whatever else, um, those political interests have, you know, are benefiting um, from the activity of these of these uh, big actors. And so oftentimes people were describing just a sort of situation in which there was no um, initiative on the part of uh, the elements in the government that ought to be applying pressure, ought to be implementing the law um, in no small part because of state capture because um, elements in the state are are benefiting uh, from from the frictionless extraction of of cobalt and other minerals um, one thing however that a lot of people emphasize was the fact that one solution uh, that is important is uh, sort of providing more funding you know be it government funding or whatever else to the sort of research uh, that we saw as an example Professor Banza doing. Um, one thing that we tried to tease out in the film, hopefully successfully, was the fact that, you know, I, I mean, it's a, a really impressive, um, uh, it's really impressive research um, conducted by Professor Banza and the team. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's underfunded. If you look at the sort of scale of the task that they're setting out to accomplish, um, you know, they're working in a laboratory that's the size of a sort of large college dormitory. It was difficult for us to film in there even because there's just not enough space there's eight people standing around working it's you know at the end of the day and they're the sort of one-stop shop they're at the vanguard of this sort of research um and what we tried to tease out was this sort of ragtag team of the Congolese researchers who are at the vanguard of looking at this issue who are up against billion dollar mechanized uh, extractive industries based in China, based in the West, publicly traded in Canada, owned in Mauritius, working in lockstep with the Congolese government. It's like an impossible problem, you know, when, when put like that. So one key solution is just more investment in this sort of robust research into the problem and the sources of this sort of pollution and the sources of... Um, of uh, this sort of uh, public health crisis, yeah. 
Okay, well, that's very interesting. And you put it very well, emphasizing just the size of the lab. Um, let's turn to a couple questions from the audience. Uh, we have Bennett Hansen, who is asking, do you know of any industrial cobalt mining in North or South Kivu? And do the armed groups in the area interact with the industrial mining companies? Uh, one of you might just explain to those in the audience where North and South Kivu are in relation to the Mubashi. Do you want to answer um, I can? Uh, Robert, well, I, you know, um, I haven't been to, to Eastern Congo for a while, so you're more attuned, you know, you're, you're, you have a more recent experience. So um, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, well, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, industrial cobalt operations, no, but there are industrial mines in, um, in East Congo. Yeah, so North and South Kivu are pretty far to the north of, um, of Katanga. Um, it's, you know, the area where I spend most of my time, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's described as sort of a hotbed of conflict. There's a lot of armed conflict there. I mean, there are a number of industrial operations for the extraction of a number of minerals. Um, and there's a lot of talk. Uh, there's another narrative, one that I think is a very bad narrative, um, about uh, so-called conflict minerals, which again looks at mostly artisanal, you know, hand miners, and says, well, you know, these hand miners have links to armed groups because of the activity of these hand miners. Um, armed groups are supplying themselves and they're financing and all of the rest. Uh, this was a major, major sort of narrative in the press that resulted in um, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act having a provision that basically forced companies that are buying um, minerals like coltan from the Congo to disclose uh, if there, you know, there's possible conflict up the supply chain. Um, it made no impact on conflict in East Congo. There's not really even good evidence that there's a link between between conflict and artisanal mining of, um, of minerals, but it did immiserate mining families, tens of thousands of mining families left destitute, you know, no access to their livelihoods and so forth, all because of a narrative that at the end of the day was sort of canned and not even really true. Um, people sort of derisively referred to Dodd-Frank as La Loi Obama um, through much of East Congo because it was really devastating for a lot of people. And it's a good example of the sort of, uh, devastating stuff that can happen when the media uh, sort of reproduces narratives that are perhaps untrue or perhaps lopsided. And uh, just last thing, connecting it to uh, the issue in Katanga, in 2017, after an investigation from the Washington Post and another from Sky News into child labor, um, Apple talked about um, uh, temporarily suspending purchases of artisanal uh, artisanally mined cobalt in Katanga. So again, you have sort of a similar problem coming forward because of sort of lopsided emphasis and um, sort of canned narrative. So there are, there are industrial mining actors, not of cobalt in North and South Kivu. Um, and I don't think really there's much to do with, uh, with the armed conflict. Yeah. Okay. And uh, a question from Yves Laurent. What do you think about the recent state-owned company that would be able to purchase and sell the country's hand mined cobalt? Do you think it can improve hand miners' conditions? I don't know if you're, this is Fiona, a little bit to... away from the film. Well, um, I'm not sure how uh, knowledgeable I am about this specific issue, but I think um, the, Cong the Congolese state has consistently shown that it's, um, uh, you, you know, not, 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 uh, not the organization that you want to control your livelihood, I think. Um, so I, I don't think that would uh, necessarily be, be helpful. Um, I think, you know, I think with a lot of um, issues in Congo, taking, uh, you know, civil society has, um, is, is incredibly expert at organizing themselves because of the absence of the state. And for you know many many decades they have uh, you know the civilian population have had to find a way to organize their lives and their livelihoods um, on their own. And I think um, actually they're you know to empower them will actually improve their conditions rather than handing um, you know organization over to the state, which is consistently shown to be you know unable to function properly and and 
to be you know fairly corrupt i don't know what, what robert would uh, like to add yeah and just quickly i mean the state um is responsible for a lot of violence against artisanal miners you know sort of brutally keeping people off of concessions that are supposed to be owned by industrial actors things like that it's you know it, I, I think the state would be very keen to find any new excuse um, to marginalize artisanal miners and carve out more space for industrial actors um, and so I don't I wouldn't put a vote of confidence in in the Congolese state um, uh, in in most issues relating to hand miners yeah. So, and now a question that again relates to accountability. And this is from Lauren Mermelstein. Do you think there is more hope that mining companies will be held to account now that Shisekedi is in power? So is the new government administration going to make a difference? Um, um, well, Robert, you go. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I would just say that, uh, you know, political dynamics in Kinshasa, uh, there are a lot of people who are keen to wade in on it, but it is a really sort of complicated issue. Until recently, um, you know, a lot of Shisekedi's power base was very deeply sort of embedded in, um, you know, Kabilist linked uh, factions uh, in the government. Um, only very recently has Shisekedi sort of properly carved out an independent space, uh, independent base of power. Um, but looking at the changes Shisekedi made or the, the ways in which Shisekedi derogated from um, the sort of Kabilist norm with respect to public health, you know, in the Ministry of Health, with respect to security and so forth, um, I wouldn't expect a major, you know, sort of um, sea change. Um, I think that a lot of it's sort of scrambling to carve out um, independent power bases and not per se a real robust um, and honest commitment to uh, to reforming aspects of the of the country in a in a meaningful way but I could be proven wrong yeah okay thank you and we really appreciate these questions this one is from Raphael Deber uh, how have you associated the Congolese researchers you mentioned with the production of your documentary? Or perhaps how have you worked together with them or incorporated their findings? Um, yeah, just to, I mean, initially, um, uh, you know, I approached, um, as I said, pro uh, Professor um, Benoit um, in, in Belgian, and he put me in touch with uh, a group led by Professor Banza um, and another uh, professor, Professor Coyer, who uh, Robert filmed um, his um, work that's uh, testing fish for uh, toxic metals. Um, and so we were really uh, went to report their work and to investigate their work, um, as well as um, the work of doctors, um, one particular surgeon who we featured in the film, um, and uh, to, uh, to show um, uh, the, the work that the, the doctors and the scientists are doing. So I think it was a, you know, um, a sort of straightforward, uh, you know, linear narrative of um, the research um, and the people that it's, uh, it's affecting um, through sort of case history with uh, a mother and her two children who, who were both born with cleft palates. Um, so, uh, as I say, this is the first time that anyone's made um, a film showing their research because there has been a few, a couple of uh, uh, print articles. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope to stay in touch with them to also to see what follow up there may be and um, what new research they may be uh, doing in the future, because it's something that, um, you know, we'd like to stick with and do more of in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I, I want to turn for a minute just to the filmmaking process. And Fiona, I'm wondering how COVID has changed uh, your way of making films now for the last year? Yeah, it's been, I mean, pretty dramatic because before COVID, um, the probability would have been that I would have gone to Congo myself um, and to, to make the film or to work with Robert. 
um, and that wasn't possible. And so I think, you know, COVID has brought a lot of challenges, which aren't necessarily a bad thing. I think it, it's been a very positive experience working together. And um, I'm, you know, I think the the film is um, is is powerfully portraying the story. So. Um, I think there are, you know, COVID makes us look at new ways to work um, and they're, they're different. Um, and I think one of the positives actually is that, um, you know, there's less air travel, that if we are really mindful about the environment and about our impact on the environment, you know, we don't always need to travel ourselves that we can find, you know, by teaming up with Robert, who's based in, in DRC and working with um, other uh, local Congolese crew, um, you know, it, we've been able to make a, a really strong film and, and it doesn't mean that I have to go um, and, and do it all the time. And it's actually, you know, worked really very well. As long as one has, you know, good internet connections, um, it's feasible. Uh, you know, without them, it becomes more challenging. But, um, you know, when we were editing, you know, Robert was, uh, did the filming. We, we kept in very close touch the whole time about what he was able to film and what we were, what he was, um, you know, what was been said in the interviews and and the the sequences um and then sending the footage back which i then could look at and start to um uh, start the editing process but my editor was in a different part of the uk um we met in a car park where i gave him the the drive and then through through zoom um he would edit and and i could see what he was doing and and um, put my comments in and obviously i'd done the preparation work um, before he started so that he had instructions and I could talk to him and, and share what he was doing. But everything was done remotely, which you know is a, is a first to do it like that. But actually it worked extremely well. Um, and I think we were very lucky that, that we had a really fantastic team. Um, and although it's the first time Robert and I actually made a film together, we've been talking about um, uh, doing a project for, together for over two years. Um, and I deliberately chose um, a picture editor who I first worked with 20 years ago um, at the BBC and, and um, the film that we worked on together uh, won a, a Royal Television Society Award. So, you know, we know each other very well. He's, you know, extremely experienced. Um, and the same with the, um, uh, the sound mixer, the dubbing mixer. Um, and the online editor, the, people, the, the editor who, who finished the film, were all people that I've worked with before and um, really trust and are extremely experienced. So it, it you know, we, I was fortunate that I could actually get a team together who um, we sort of knew each other quite well and that um, could could sort of make work quite quite well. I mean, I don't know how Robert felt about the uh, about the experience. Oh, it was a miserable, a miserable, terrible experience. No, um, I, I, I couldn't put it, I couldn't put it better than you could, to be sure. Really, really wonderful experience. Yeah. Well, Robert, do you have any advice for journalists or filmmakers who are want to work in the DRC? Yeah, I mean, I would encourage them not to, so there's less competition. Um, no, uh, I. The main thing for me um, is, I, I think it really matters. Um, I mean, I've already sort of expressed that. I mean, frankly, the sort of parachutism that's not, admittedly, because people, you know, want to sort of only be in a place for a very brief period of time. It's often because of restrictions and budgets and so forth and so on. But nonetheless, uh, one of the things that turns my stomach most really is the way in which people will act as though they've got a real robust bottom to top understanding of a place after having been there for, you know, all of four days um, and, you know, not really sort of spend any time coming to understand the place and the context and the story in a robust um, and thorough way. So the main thing for me is, you know, if, if, if one is, you know, one can be a successful reporter and just sort of do, you know, whatever they please and have a sort of freewheeling lifestyle and, and, and all the rest. But I, I think if one is to be a good reporter uh, in DRC or anywhere, um, the number one thing for me is sort of avoiding that, that parachutism and being cautious about narratives and paying attention to when one may or may not be putting out reporting that is at the end of the day sort of convenient for uh, for very powerful actors. It's you know that's my two cents. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, well, before we close, uh, we wanted to talk about what the impact of this film can be and what you hope it to be. And actually, Robbie Seaton Todd has a question that's a perfect wrap up. He says, in addition to increased research funding, what goals do you hope to see as a response to your reporting? In other words, what are some ways for both locals in DRC and people outside the country to help mitigate these human rights violations? So perhaps both of you could answer that briefly. Um, obviously, I think you know the, the main um, aim is to raise awareness um, and is to uh, raise enough awareness that um, to, to bring about some kind of positive change. I think, you know, here in the UK, um, the, the British government has said that um, they're going to phase out petrol and diesel cars and vans um, by 2030. And to do that, they, there needs to be a lot of cobalt to make the batteries for these electric vehicles. So, you know, it's in, um, it, if, if, when I've tried to get films commissioned in the past, people have said, why, why should we make up a film about the Congo? It doesn't affect us at all. You know, this is the, the, the one, the best example where an issue in the Congo affects everybody. It affects the whole world. If we are going to get on top of climate change and actually reduce emissions, and um, if electric vehicles are really going to um, uh, become absolutely standard, which seems to be what a lot of you know, the EU and um, certainly the UK uh, are, are aiming to do and China is stepping up you know, production, um, then you know, governments can put pressure on, um, on mining companies. They can put pressure on mining on, on cobalt battery producers and they can put pressure on um, car manufacturers. Um, and there are you know, lots of ways of doing that. So you know, this is the year that actually something could happen because we're coming up to COP26 in November in Glasgow. Um, and whether that will be a virtual event or they, you know, they say that people will come, although um, uh, I think you know, that, that's, we'll have to see what happens by November with the COVID pandemic. But, um, this is the one year where maybe something can be done to change and you know we all have a responsibility I think to to put pressure on governments to to say to producers and manufacturers and, and car manufacturers you know you've got to if, if you're going to have a, 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 a cobalt um, based battery which at the moment is the main te technology that's used for electric vehicles then this has to be produced in a way that is not poisoning and destroying the environment from where it's originated. And I think, you know, we see a very extraordinarily um, similar parallel to just over 100 years ago with the sort of rush to harvest rubber for the then at that time newly, um, you know, just got newly created uh, automobile industry, um, where, you know, the sort of mass atrocities that happened in the Congo, you know, there is a sort of bizarre parallel to today where the environment is being poisoned, where um, birth defects um, seem to be widespread and with the links to industrial mining and to, to cobalt mining. Um, and that it's, it's happening again, but, you know, we have the, um, the knowledge um, and governments have the influence and the power to, to make a difference this time. Um. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, I, I don't think I could put it better than that, but there is indeed, you know, this sort of irony that, you know, we're here talking about the climate crisis at the tail end of, you know, process, the industrial revolution that, you know, really found its, as its starting point, you know, Belgians coming, extracting rubber, engaging in massive atrocities. Um, and now we're talking about a solution um, that re reproduces, you know, it, it, not just in connection with the, with the pollution, but also with, in connection with massive human rights abuses conducted by these, by these actors and by the military in support of these actors and so forth. Um, we're talking about a solution to the climate crisis that at the end of the day rep reproduces those modes of violence uh, and, and dehumanization of Congolese lives that attended the uh, initial extraction of rubber that set off the whole ugly process in the first place. You know, we're talking about a sort of consumer-oriented solution that doesn't really change much. And, you know, the sort of structures that exist, you know, the global economy, all the rest, just 
have have consumers buy um, electric cars as opposed to internal combustion engine vehicles, and then you know everything will be um, hunky dory. Um, I would hope that uh, at a minimum, as as a consequence of the film, which is documenting um, what is in the grand scheme a small aspect of some of the consequences of that sort of failure to robustly question the you know sort of structures that exist globally today. Um, I would hope that there would be sort of interest in uh, reimagining solutions uh, to the climate crisis and thinking about sort more meaningful, sustainable, and um, fundamental changes than just re reproducing the sorts of violence that got us here in the first place. That's, yeah. Well, I think we are out of time, so we're going to have to wrap this up. And thank you. That was a I think an inspiring way to end um, from both of you. And I wanna thank all of you for being here. Uh, please do watch the film and you can find a link to the cost of cobalt on our website. We are so thankful to Fiona Lloyd Davies and Robert Flummerfelt for this conversation. We will be posting a recording online at pulitzercenter.org in the coming days. Uh, so please feel free to share the post. And thank you to everyone on this Zoom for joining in and for asking questions, much appreciated. Thanks also to my colleagues at the Pulitzer Center, especially Abigail Gibson, our producer for this session, and Holly Pippenberg, our conference coordinator. For those who are able, please remember we're a nonprofit journalism organization, and so we depend on donor support. Please donate today and become a Pulitzer Center champion. Check out pulitzercenter.org events to see additional panels during our Environment Redefined conference. Our next session is tomorrow, Breaking Native America and Alaska Native Stereotypes. That will be Friday, the 23rd of April at 1230 Eastern time. Please do stay with us a few minutes longer to take a brief survey after we officially end today's session. So thank you again and goodbye for now. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you.